Well, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Julie Bershotsky. I am the Director of Community Living and Employment here at Institute of Community Integration at University of Minnesota. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her. I'm a white, middle-aged white uh, woman with short black hair wearing a black t-shirt. I am sitting in my home office with a bunch of books behind me. Um, you may also see my dog's tail once in a while when he, when and if he ventures in, which is likely to happen. Uh, thank you for joining us for this edition of the ICI Policy Forum. We try to do these on a regular basis uh, every couple of months or so. The last one was in early April, I believe. The topic today is based on the latest edition of the policy research brief. That topic is, are large institutions for people with IDD a thing of the past? Um, some housekeeping notes real quick. Today's forum is being recorded. It will be posted on our site and on YouTube today as well. Along with the slides, uh, we will give a link to where they will be posted at the end of the forum. Uh, today's discussants are my colleague Sherry Larson, also from ICI, Celia Feinstein, formerly from Temple University, and Mary Sowers from NASDES. I will ask them to introduce themselves shortly. Also assisting is my colleague Nick Fernholtz, who will be uh, assisting with the logistics. As all our policy forums, this is an informal discussion, so feel free to chime in at any time either via voice or chat. Um, if you want to speak, you'll have to unmute yourself, just a note. We'll have audience, audience discussion questions in the end, then time for just general questions. Um, a reminder, especially given the topic, to please be respectful of others' opinions. It is fine to disagree. It is not okay to disagree disrespectfully. Uh, with that, let's get started. I'm going to ask our discussants to introduce themselves. I'll then I'll briefly talk about the issue and our data before we launch into the discussion. Sherry, would you like to introduce yourself first? Sure, thanks. Um, I'm Sherry Larson from the University of Minnesota. I have been working at the Research and Training Center on Community Living since it started in 1989. Um, and I'm the director of the Residential Information Systems Project. And our project is highlighted in today's uh, policy forum. I'm a getting on older white woman with blonde hair and a blue top. I have a University of Minnesota background behind me. Great. Celia, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Celia Feinstein, and I was formerly the executive director of the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, Pennsylvania's University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Um, I have been um, formally retired from Temple um, for the last two years, but I'm still very much involved in work in the field. I too, um, I like Sherry's expression of getting on white female. I suppose if Julie's middle-aged, I'm probably ancient, um, but um, I am in my home office, which um, is in Conifer, Colorado right now. Um, and I am, I wear glasses and I am wearing a pink top. Um, I guess that's about it. Thank you. I would definitely not call you ancient, Celia, but you can <laughs> call you. yourself whatever you want. Um, and last but not least, Mary. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Mary Sowers. I am the executive director at the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services. My preferred pronouns are she and her. I'm a middle-aged white woman with blonde-ish hair uh, pulled up today and I'm wearing an orange top. It's a pleasure to be with you um, and look forward to the conversation today. Great, thank you. Thank you all to all three of you for being here. Um, as I said, today's policy forum is about putting lar is about large institutions for people with IDD and what's been happening with them. Um, the topic is based on the last issue of the policy research brief shown on the next slide. Nick, if you want to click through, we will use the, the brief to talk through the issue and discuss. Um, 
this is obviously it's very small, but we just wanted to show you what the brief itself looks like. Um, it's been published a couple of weeks ago. It's it's a two page publication, very plain language with just a few key findings. Um, and that's that that these 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 briefs are what all of our policy forums are based on. So this is what this past this last issue of the brief looks like. You can also find it on our website, and we'll put links to that um, at the end. All right, so our research issue today is, uh, is large institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we'll specifically talk about whether uh, they are a thing of the past and what we can expect to happen with them. A uh, little bit about what this is based on, and then I'll ask Sherry to talk more about it. The, the data that will, you'll be shown are based on the Residential Information System Project, RISP, which is a long last, long standing project. It studies specifically places where people with IDD live when they get public funded services and it covers all 50 states. So I'm gonna ask Sherry to talk because she is the expert in this to talk more about, um, about RISP, uh, sort of the history of RISP, background and methods for uh, the data that will be showing today. All right, thanks, Julie. So. Um, the RISC project is um, funded by the Administration on uh, Community Living. It is authorized under the Developmental Disabilities Act. It is a longitudinal data project of national significance, one of three. Um, the other two um, are at Colorado. They used to be at Colorado, now at Kansas, the state of the states, and then the um, employment uh, group at um, ICI Boston. Um, and so the RISP project began, it, it wasn't called RISP then, but in 1977, the University of Minnesota, uh, Bob Rudix and Charlie Lakin um, worked on a national census of state-run uh, IDD institutions. And they repeated that census in 1982. And by 1982, um, they, were, they had a really hard time finding all of the places where people with intellectual or developmental disabilities lived because um, we had gone from just state institutions to a, a system where there was lots of other kinds of places and it became clear that it wasn't gonna be poss possible to do a census of all the places where people live um, by contacting each facility anymore at that time. And so um, the, the, the RISC project um, is designed to um, gather annual information about what's happening in residential supports and long-term supports and services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We survey state IDD agencies on an annual basis, asking them about the people that they serve. And we also survey um, the state institutions, the state-run facilities that are still open. So when we started that, um, there were 350 some uh, state institutions open and now we're under a hundred that we contact every year and we just for those we just try to find out what are the characteristics of the people who are living in the in the facilities so um and then just uh, for context the data that we show in this presentation is based on um, state uh, fiscal year uh, 2018 so as of june 30th of 2018 um, and I think that's probably enough for this purpose. Okay, great. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, we can move into our key findings now. So this is the, we only have four key findings. So we didn't want to overwhelm people with data. Um, so we're going to frame our conversations around it, around those four key findings. The first being, I'm going to read the, read the heading and then um, ask Sherry to talk a little bit more about what is presented in the slide. Um, so the bottom line here is that 50 years ago, there were 10 times more people living in large state-run IDD institutions than there are today. Um, Sherry, do you want to talk a little bit more about what is shown in the context for this? Yeah, so the graph that is uh, shown here just shows that the peak um, uh, number of people, uh, average daily population of large IDD institutions came in 1967. There were 194,650 people uh, in, uh, in those settings in that year. Uh, about half of those people were children. Um, by 2018, all of the almost all of the children were gone and there were only 17,596 people remaining in those large state institutions. I'm going to pose a question now to all three of our panelists because that is something that you know occurs to me as I'm looking at this 
decrease. Um, what are the contributing factors that led to this decrease? Um, sort of what are, what are what are the main I guess what are the main things that have happened in these in these fifty years um, that we see such a such a big change? And whoever wants to kick it off our, of our three panelists can do so. Uh, this is Mary. I'm I'm happy to jump in, but we'll um, we'll cede the floor to my esteemed colleagues at any point. <laughs> Um, just looking at this timeline, I think we can, um, in our mind's eye, overlay monumental pieces of legislation that change the expectation for community living for individuals with disabilities across the country, namely IDEA and the um, and the passage of the Omnibus Budget and Reconciliation Act of 1981, which included the provisions in Medicaid to allow uh, states to offer home and community-based services to individuals with disabilities. I also think sort of aside from that legislative context, there's just been a collective shift in um, cultural norms and expectations about the, um, the opportunities for individuals to have meaningful and good lives in the communities of their choosing. So um, I think there's probably a lot of factors um, in addition to those, but I think those created an environment where uh, states really had tools at their disposal to support individuals effectively in their homes and communities. Um, this is Celia. I think just to tag on to everything Mary has said, um, I think the presence over that period of time of litigation um, against states, um, against, against governments um, to get people into settings of their choosing was also a key factor in the reduction of those populations. Um, and along with that, I would also say the rise of the self-advocacy movement clearly had an impact on what was going on in state institutions, how state institutions were monitored. And again, in terms of the litigation, self-advocates played a pivotal role in ensuring that those institutions reduced in size and closed. And, yeah, so and, back, back, oh, sorry, Mary. Yeah, oh, I was just going to jump in and say, and Celia, to that point on the litigation, the, the conditions in, the, in many of those institutions that absolutely contributed to that, I think, opened people's eyes to the, the need to su support individuals. I'm so sorry, Sherry. No, that's fine. And, and, and actually, that's exactly where I was going to go. Um, I, the, the issue was that there was lots of people living in institutions, but they were miserable places. And so Congress decided that they would throw federal money into the pot for the first time for long-term supports and services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But it came with a bunch of strings. And one of the strings was they had to reduce overcrowding, they had to improve the conditions, and they had to provide what was called then active treatment. And so one of the biggest factors in this decline in the beginning was that because, it, well, the other thing that came up at this, it, in nearly the same time was the um, 94142 public education of all children. Um, so instead of having to send to, uh, children to institution for some kind of education or training, families had a, a community-based alternative. They could send their kids to the school in their, in their neighborhood. And so in the early years, probably up through the mid eighties, um, a lot of the reduction was both kids moving out of institution and also um, no kids coming in. Um, and, and so the, how, do you, how do you close institutions? It has both components. You stop people from coming in and you help the people who are there to move out. And we have a, we have a comment on the chat and it's an example. 50 years ago, the Willowbrook expose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was under, that undergirded, I think, kind of why Congress yeah. jumped in and decided they needed to do something about this. It became Absolutely. a public issue across the nation in in not just in disability world. Great. Okay, let's go to the next slide and our next uh, key finding. All right. So this is about trends, and if trends continue, um, share, I'll ask Sherry to talk again more about what is actually presented. But we're trying. What is be, do, being done here is trying to project those same trends a few years ahead. So, what if those trends continue? What would we see? Sherry, you want to talk about that a little bit more? 
Yeah, so this is risk data and it's it, there are two data elements here. One of them is the number of people living in state run institutions. And the, set, the other is how many people live in non-state um, settings that are that are institutions. In other words, there are 16 or more people living in them. So the yellow, the orange bars are the state-run institutions, and the and the green bars are the non-state institutions. And what you can see from both of those solid lines is the population, as the previous slides show, the population of both of those kinds of settings um, is declining at a at a pretty rapid pace. Um, and if those trends continue, we uh, we could be without large state institutions by 2025. Now. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but let me just finish ex uh, explaining what the slide is. So we, we took the trend line through 2018 and we projected it forward um, and said, if this trend line continues as it is from 2018 to 2025, we could be at, at no places with 15 or more people. Um, of course, we all know there's a lot of things that have happened between 2018 uh, and now um, that are gonna be interfering, inter interviewing factors, um, but there are, um, there are also some other reasons why that may or may not happen. But the reason we're talking today is we're getting close. We're, we actually can see the finish line. We can, we can see a projected end date um, that's within the next uh, few years. So the other thing to note on this slide is that the state institutions, this population of state institutions, which was higher to start with, is now lower than the population of non-state institutions. Um, and the trend line for non-state institutions is going much more slowly. And so it, the projection isn't until 2037. And there's some important reasons for that too, in terms of state versus non-state um, ownership of property. So that's a basic introduction. And I think we'll get into the other factors. Great. There's a, there's a comment in chat about what basically what's considered to be institutions. I think I'll come back to that question in a, in a few slides if, if uh, you want to hold on to that. Um, and also in nursing homes, we'll talk about that as well, Susan, in a little while. All right. Um, I do want to ask our panelists about these trends. Um, and basically, as we're since we're projecting, and this is just these are projections. In in your opinion, and in your individual opinions, um, will this actually happen? Will we actually see these trends and projections come to life? What's the likelihood that the trend continues, and why or why not? It's interesting watching the chat because a lot of the I, a lot of the reasons yeah. why this may or may not happen are showing up in the chat. Right. Um, so from my perspective, um, there are, are several things that have happened. One of them is just the, the, the pandemic um, and the, the, the exacerbation of the staffing shortages um, that were present before the pandemic um, is, is making it really difficult to um, continue to provide access to services for people uh, in any kind of setting. Um, and it may well slow the slow the downsizing of our of, of state institutions. But I, on the other side of it, I think I, I see that there will continue to be closures of state IDD institutions over the next, between 2018 and 2025. We know that that's happening. Um, but, um, and the reason that that happens is because states are paying a lot of money per day up to, well, an average of like $400,000 per year per person to support people living in those institutions. It's gotten extraordinarily expensive because those places were built for thousands of people and there's hundreds of people living there. And so um, the state can recoup a, a lot of their money uh, by closing the institution and selling the property or repurposing the property. Um, and uh, on, the, on the flip side, I don't think we have the same incentives for non-state settings because the state won't recoup the money from the, from the, pro the properties where those are located because the uh, properties are owned by companies or private individuals. Um, this is Celia. I'm going to jump in and just um, to add to Sherry's points, a couple of other things. Um, I just, um, I'm not sure that in 2025, which is fairly just around the corner, we will see the end to large state facilities for several reasons, some of which Sher Sherry mentioned. But I also think a couple of factors that we really need to take into consideration is family opposition. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, um, the research tells us, um, 50 years of research tells us mm -hmm. that 
families tend to be opposed to closure tend to be opposed to their loved ones moving from institutions to community settings. Yet when it actually happens, they seem to be quite pleased with the resulting um, lives that their relatives are living. Um, we see currently in Pennsylvania, there is litigation pending um, filed by a parents group around the announcement of the closure of two of four of our last open state institutions. So I think that continues to be a factor. And when Julie gets into subsequent questions, we'll talk more about that, I'm sure. Um, the other factor I think that we see playing a very strong role is the role of unions. Um, unions have clearly um, been friends of the court in many of the court cases that have been filed and have played a fairly prominent role in the effort to keep institutions open. Um, and then lastly, just a comment about the non-state operated facilities, um, that clearly there is less control by the state in terms of monitoring and so on. And they're also, as Sherry pointed out, financed very differently. Um, so I think it taking much longer and much slower is problematic on a lot of levels. Um, and I think in many states as well, while states have closed institutions, there have been many situations in which the closure was the result of a conversion from public funding to private funding. So we, I know in Pennsylvania, we have facilities that had been run by the state that are now privately operated, so. And, and I think that I don't have much more to add. I think Celia and Sherry covered um, some of the, the reasons why 2025 seems um, highly unlikely that they'll all close, um, as, but states are continuing to um, help individuals make transitions to communities um, and more states are leveraging projects like the Money Follows the Person demonstration, um, which has just been sort of re-released by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to help with those transitions. Mm -hmm. But this also often reflects um, some areas of needed uh, capacity building in the community. Um, many of our members continue to support individuals who might have dual diagnosis of behavioral health and IDD in some of their institutional settings or folks with particularly complex medical conditions. And I think it's incumbent on us to look reflectively about what capacity exists in the community to meet the mm -hmm. needs of individuals there as well. So I suspect that, that will, those efforts will absolutely continue in the coming years and hopefully will continue to chip away at the, the utilization of those pieces. And the, the non-state run IDD institutions, you know, they, as, as Celia mentioned, they they are, while they oftentimes, but not uniformly, there's probably a lot packed into the non-state run category. Um, sometimes they're privately run um, uh, ICS, IDD, the intermediate care facilities, which is the Medicaid um, uh, institutional label. Um, and and they, it, it just, um, it, it does become slightly more difficult to um, uh, reduce the size of those um, once the licensure has been established within states, although not entirely impossible, particularly as many providers are seeing the benefits who, of, of maybe expanding their community-based footprint in home and community-based services as an alternative to those institutional settings. So um, hopefully we might see additional movement in that regard too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one last comment, and then Julie, I think we should move on, but there's a great uh, thread of, of discussion happening in the chat, and I just wanted to talk about one of the points that, that um, has been made there, and that is that um, these are not, these are not, these two types of facilities aren't the only kinds of institutions where people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live. There are people living in nursing homes and living in psychiatric facilities um, and, and living in child welfare settings or ju juvenile or adult justice system settings that will remain even if the state run IDD institutions uh, downsize or close uh, in, the, in the near future. So um, I think the comment about what about nursing homes is accurate. The current number that we have is about 120,000 people with IDD living in um, any kind of institutional setting, including nursing homes, psychiatric facilities, IDD um, institutions, whether public or private. 
and people living in um, group settings of, of seven to 15 people. Um, those are large um, group settings. And um, there's still, like I said, 120,000 people. So of those 120,000, you know, about 40,000 live in one of these two kinds of places, but many of them live in other places. So we won't be done with institution, uh, even if the orange bar turns out to be correct. There is an abs there is a very lively discussion happening in the chat. Some of it has to do with the um, you know with definition of true choice and whether people should have the choice should be able to choose to live in institutions if if they'd like to. We'll get to that at the end. I'd like to reserve that to the end. But there is another thread that's running through that um, I'm gonna voice because it's it's an interesting question um, and it's it's related to these trends and projections, and that is the the issue of uh, the the workforce shortages that we're seeing right now uh, and they don't seem to be getting better obviously they've been they will they've been bad for a long time but they've been, been getting even worse so any thoughts from our panelists on what effect that might have and whether it's too early to say well i i we are beyond crisis in terms of our staffing, whether it's for the institutions or whether it's for another kind of setting. It's, it's an issue across the board. In Minnesota, we had National Guard members going into nursing homes because they couldn't staff the nursing homes um, and going into group homes too. So um, it is a, it's a big issue. It was made much worse by the pandemic, um, by the number of people who dropped out of the workforce because of the pandemic. Um, we have the demographic of our, our, our company, or our country aging, and so other people leaving the workforce because of age. Um, but there are countervening effects too. So CMS um, in its American Recovery Act um, money uh, put a lot of uh, made it available to states to do initiatives to try to address the staffing shortages. Um, and I think just about every state who submitted an ARA plan included at least one initiative around the direct support workforce. So we're, we're putting a lot of effort into it. CMS, in terms of the policy world that's pushing on this, uh, they're trying very hard to support states to make sure that um, access to services continues to be uh, available. States have, um, some states are starting to implement some uh, fairly widespread uh, interventions around staff training. I think New York's got a staff training initiative and, and a credentialing initiative going on. So there's, yes, it's an issue. Yes, it needs to be addressed. Yes, it's an issue across all settings, not just institutions and not just community settings. I'm interested in what my colleagues have to say or think about that. I I would just agree, Sherry. I, you know, um, across the country, I, I don't think there's a state that wouldn't identify the workforce issues as the most pivotal um, challenge to supporting individuals successfully, both in the community and in institutional settings. It is it is a ubiquitous challenge. I think there's a growing recognition in home and community-based services. And I think one of the commenters alluded to this, that the rates of pay have been largely inadequate and that there's a need to both professionalize and, and, and provide sufficient pay. Um, but even with those pieces, it's not, it's not enough that there really needs to be investments in um, helping individuals see it as a viable career uh, opportunity and, and really structuring those pieces. So we're encouraged to see states putting um, resources both uh, toward wages um, and strategies for retention, um, but also very much trying to invest in the professionalization of this workforce, which is absolutely critical. Um, if, if everyone didn't know it before, it was certainly recognized widely during the pandemic, um, but these, these folks are absolutely essential and it's, it's, um, it's time to recognize the profession as such. And I would like to give great kudos to our colleagues at the University of Minnesota, frankly, who have been leading out in this space um, across the country. And I think just a, a last, point, um, perhaps I, I'm watching the chat thread as well. There have been many comments about whether there has been consideration of paying parents as caregivers. And I think there are many, many, many examples of states that have included the payment of relatives for providing support. And I think that's something that we will see increasing as well. Um, as part of the shortage that Mary and Sherry alluded to, but also because it, in many situations, it makes good sense. 
Yeah, and just to kind of bring us back to the data and prepare us to go on to the next slide, um, there's some, there's some, we, we, we're staying focused on just four key findings in this policy form, but I just, I just taught a class um, to a bunch of graduate students on this very topic. And one of the things, one of the slides I showed in that um, setting was uh, one of the ways that we accomplished um, serving most people in community settings is by increasing supports for family members. So almost all of the growth in services since 1998 has been an increase in the number of people living with family members who get funded supports while living in that in the, in the family home. Uh, I think we've gone from about 350,000 people um, in, living in family homes getting supports to uh, 900,000 people living with families and getting supports. Um, and most of those people, um, an increasing number of those people are getting funding through the Medicaid waiver program uh, for those supports. And I'm, I'm sure that we're gonna be continuing to depend on uh, families uh, as we move forward in terms of support, whether that uh, shift to families will impact the people who live in institution or not is a different question because most of the people in institution uh, are older. They've been in institution for most of the, most or all of their lives. There are a, there are a group that Mary alluded to who are young people um, with challenging behavior, but most of the people in institution um, are, are aging. They're in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and so the implications of uh, support for family members in terms of the, that trend is probably not going to bear out as much. But we depend a lot on families. 85% of all people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, whether they get supports or not, live with their families throughout their lives. And um, 60% uh, of the people who get supports through Medicaid um, live with family members and get those supports while living with family members. So, all right, let's let's uh, let's move on and look at what's happening sort of around the country because this was an overall picture. Um, this, th there are wide state to state variations. And I think uh, is again, as, it, as, is, as is evidenced by the discussion in the chat, there are, different things are happening in different states and states are approaching the problem differently. Um, Sherry, again, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about what's shown in the slide itself and then I have some questions for you guys. Great, and I, I think Julie, if we, or Nick, if you can grab the chat, save the chat um, from this call, I think we're gonna to wanna to post the chat along with the slides and along with the video because it's hard to, for anybody to follow all of what's going on here. And there's a great discussion going on. So this, this slide, um, talks about one of the biggest issues that affects um, services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the board. There's tremendous variation in services um, state to state. And in this case, we're talking about what's happening in terms of state-run institutions. So 17 states as of 2018 had closed all of their state-run institutions. There were none left. They found a way to serve everybody who had been in an institution in another setting. Um, and there are, but there are also four states <laughs> Uh, Texas, Illinois, North Carolina, and New Jersey that still serve more than a thousand people in state-run institutions. And in Texas, it's almost 3,000 people um, still remaining. And so where you live makes a really big difference or what state you live in makes a really big difference in terms of um, your access to different kinds of services. All right, so my question to you then is, so the, the, the dark blue states, the states with more than a thousand people, um, that that still have uh, more than a thousand people in, in state run institution institutions what what is up with those states what are they doing or not doing um and what is that what is what is their context what, what are their barriers that we know of um what makes them different i'm happy to jump in but anxious to uh hear from my colleagues as well i think for all 50 states in the district of columbia each state has um, its own history on the evolution of both the development and, and um, evolution of the entire DD service delivery system. And so I think what you see um, in the four states noted is probably a, a, both an origin story that is it, that grew up differently than some of the other states, but also perhaps has lacked the political context to make as much progress toward community-based services um, as some of the other states as well. 
I do, um, you know, certainly the contextual pieces that that Celia referenced earlier um, continue to play an important role mm -hmm. in these four states. Um, but it, it also, I think, speaks to um, the other side of the coin and, and sort of the opportunity that those states have had to build up their community-based systems of support to make sure that they've got an adequate alternative to institutional services as well. So there's probably um, both sort of political and practical uh, challenges that have contributed to to these uh, statistics, um, and and I think there though in in each of those states you'll see a, um, a continued emphasis uh, of trying to uh, make headway in those areas um, in in lots of different ways. So um, certainly much work to do um, in building up those community capacity pieces, but I think each one everyone's like an archaeological dig, and you can go back through um, sort of historical times and see how the system evolved over time and those factors that have really contributed to the the sort of solidifying of certain institutions, no pun intended, within those states. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would agree, and I would also say that the dark blue states, um, probably with the exception of New Jersey, have experienced some of the um, some some of the greatest episodes of litigation during the history of of our field. So that doesn't surprise me. And I think also not to repeat a phrase, but I think the existence of unions. Um, and strong family groups, again, has been significant in many of those states. And, and the converse is true. I know we're talking about the states that still have yeah. um, lots of folks that live there. But I think if, if you look at those states with no institutions mm -hmm. or those that serve very few people there, they've had um, significant grassroots movements that have, have really yeah. catapulted the states. Um, toward building a, a, a community capacity that can really support individuals to thrive um, in their communities, regardless of support needs. And that's an important piece of the equation. As Absolutely. Well. Yeah. And so just a reminder that this is just a picture of state run institutions here. There are also non state institutions. And in, in many of these states, there's only, I think, two or three states that have closed both state operators, state run and non-state run institutions. So this does not say that these 17 states are without institutions. It says they're without state run mm -hmm. institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities specifically. Um, it doesn't talk to that other part. Um, and that's a very important thing. I also wanted to just mention regarding um, union um, uh, efforts, unions are um, often involved in the institutionalization discussions because oftentimes institutions were built in rural communities and are the largest employer in those communities. And mm -hmm. so the employees there and the communities in those places uh, have a lot to lose if institutions close because the, they won't have employment for those people. Now, what's happened in the states where the institutions have closed? The, the facilities in some states have been turned into prisons. And so there's still a workforce. It's just now a prison instead of a place for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and then in, in regards to families, Celia mentioned some of the research that she did um, with the Penhurst study, um, and also that other people have done um, that shows that um, the family opposition is sometimes it's just lack of information, but other times parents have had some, uh, some really bad experiences um, and have struggled to find the right kind of supports for their for their sons or daughter and are, are afraid that this monolith <laughs> um, that it's going to be there forever even when after they die um, it, that it that it might go away so there's a lot of um, there are a lot of factors that go into a discussion about closing a facility but the I think where we need to think about is each individual person uh, and where that person wants to live and where we can support that person effectively and how we can connect that person to their family and to their community uh, in the most effective way possible. Great discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to the next slide. That's our last sort of data key finding slide that we'll talk about. Um, and this deals with state IDD institutions versus non-state IDD institutions. Mm -hmm. And again, Sherry, if you could say a couple of words about what is actually shown here. 
Yeah, I actually referred to this in the earlier slide. The number of people in state-run institutions is going down and it's going down faster than the number of people in non-state-run institutions, but their number of non-state-run institutions is also going down. What's changed in the last couple of years, and this literally has been within, um, I think it was in, 19, uh, in 2017, where the number of people in non-state institution um, exceeded the number of people in state-run IDD institutions. So. That, that's the finding. And then at the bottom, you see the number of people who live in, in addition to these 40,000, um, there's another 80,000 people who live in nursing homes, psychiatric facilities, or IDD group facilities of seven to 15 people. All right. So my follow up question too, as I'm trying to understand the slide is, uh, I have a pretty good idea what the state run institutions are. What are what are non state run institutions? How are they funded? Uh, who runs them? Mm -hmm. How did they come about? Mm -hmm. what, what, what is included in this in non-state institutions? So one of the things that happened when we started the institutionalization, one of the first things that happened, uh, there was some, some, some um, efforts in CMS centers for, well, what was HICFA, but now is the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, to um, make sure that funding was not just for, for state-run institutions, but that actually, uh, that funding was also available to what was then called community <laughs> settings. And those community settings in the beginning were very large institutional settings run by an entity other than the state. And so states that, that moved early on to move people out of institution, oftentimes moved lots of people into, you know, to places with 60 to 100 uh, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that were run by an entity other than the state. So it was no longer state employees providing the services, but, but it still was an institutional setting and I think for a service. And I think, um, I think we've, had, we've talked a lot, uh, not in this uh, forum, but just in general about um, the institutional characteristics of a lot of group homes. We, um, there's, there's a lot of things that happen that affect people's lives um, when they live with lots of other people. Um, instead of the person directing what they wanna do when they wanna do it, when you have five or six or eight or 10 people sharing a house, um, your opportunity to take a shower when you can take a shower is very limited. You have to negotiate with 10 other people. Um, you don't get to pick everybody. Typically, people don't get to pick what they eat. They eat if they're a family or if they're in an uh, institution, the, the, everything is arranged for the convenience of the staff. So people eat at a set time. They eat a, a set thing. Um, they, um, they take a shower at a certain time. They go to bed at a certain time. They get up at a certain time. And there's very little flexibility. Uh, and a lot of it has to do just with the number of people that are sharing living arrangements there. Um, and so uh, the institutional qualities um, uh, of ICFs, intermediate care facilities, even a person, even an ICF that has four people living in it can feel to a person with a disability like an institution where their freedom to choose what they do when they want to do it, to eat what they want, when they want, to, to come and go as they please, and to have guests or visitors at any time is, is severely restricted. Well, Mrs. Celia, uh, um, just a, a couple of other points. Um, I think in the non-state settings in the, that we have looked at over the years, one of the things that is apparent is that the, the state and the federal government does not have the same level of control as they do on, over the state operated facilities. So when you look at the blue bars or green bars, whatever color they are, um, you can see that the reduction in, in census in those facilities has reduced at a much slower rate. And I think states, at least many of the states in which I've had experience have not spent a lot of time thinking about incentivizing reducing populations or closing facilities for the non-state entities. And that's been an issue as well. And one thing that we have seen and a number of states have, have um, tried to do this and it is also to, to, again, to Celia's point, incentivizing some providers to sort of transform their business model to offer home and community-based settings. Sometimes the non-state settings can be as small as four individuals living together and might you know, look very similar, but they still meet the institutional um, parameters set forth by the federal government. Um, and in those instances, 
um, they often carry um, some more restrictive procedures just by virtue of those conditions of participation. And the providers have been able to make transitions so that individuals can live um, in, you know, with, in community-based residences over time. Um, but the other piece, a, a number of states didn't go down the path of allowing private ICS to proliferate um, and instead simply went, you know, they may have had a, a public institution footprint and went to community-based residences. But this goes back to my earlier point that sometimes just going back through the history of how, and how these service delivery systems evolve can be extraordinarily illuminating in terms of what the picture looks like in any given state today and the particular challenges that they might face as they try to grow and expand their community-based footprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, the other point to make, the, the other really important difference between state institution and non-state institution is the average size of those places is not the same. The average size of an existing state-run IDD facility um, is something in the range of 60, I think, or 68, whereas the average size of non-state institutions, um, I'm trying to find that figure for you, but it is much smaller. It's, it's, it's closer to 20. So there are, there are other differences that, that matter um, in terms of people's experience. But if you think about it from the perspective of, do I get to have a life that I choose and control, um, it doesn't matter if there's four people or if there's uh, 400 people. Um, if I don't get to choose the things that I want to do and I don't get to uh, hang out with the people I want to hang out with and I have to share a room with somebody who I didn't pick, um, my life is not going to be as, as, um, uh, as good as it would be if I was able to be in a setting where I chose my roommate or if I had a roommate and I chose um, how I live my daily life. And I, I think that's such an important point, Sherry, and one that the home and community-based settings will just try to distinguish um, between, again, without comment on, you know, they're both permissible under Medicaid statute, but that if something is home and community-based, that it has all the attributes of that, that civil rights are, are sort of prominent in an in individual's opportunity to choose. CMS has recently, um, in recognition of the staffing shortages, been, you know, committed to working with states toward those implementation strategies, but they're yeah. holding firm on the fact that individuals indeed get to choose um, with whom they live and how they decorate their room and when they have visitors and those things that really aren't dependent on staff necessarily, um, but just are some basic human rights that we all tend to enjoy in our day-to-day -day activities. Sherry, there's a quick follow-up question that I think we can just answer real quick. Do these numbers account for children? Uh, it's not a, it's a little bit of a complicated um, question to answer, but yes. So the state ID, state IDD agencies differ in terms of what, who they include. Some, uh, there are uh, a couple of states that where the state IDD agency does not um, manage services for children. Some other agency within the state manages services for children. And, and because of that, um, we don't have very much information about kids. Um, but it, with that exception, um, these numbers do include everybody living in those places, whatever their ages are. Um, and so um, I, there aren't very many children living in either um, state operated or non-state operated settings, although there are some specialized non-state settings that are that focus on serving um, kids with various kinds of needs. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, before we go to a wider discussion and open it up to everyone and judging if the chat is any indication, there will be many opinions. Um, let's, we have some uh, recommendations that policy recommendations that um, I think that we'd like to go over. And Nick, if you could move on to the next slide. Um, I think we'll just go through these one by one. Sherry, if you wanna kick it off and then Mary and Celia, if you wanna yeah chime in with anything additional or any clarifications? Oh, I, was, I, I just wanted to jump in with, with a, and it might be better on the previous slide, but the other piece, it was a bit of a footnote on that other side, but the number of individuals who might be served in other facilities, including nursing facilities. I think our, na our nation has to do a better job for individuals with IDD who are admitted to nursing facilities. There's a statute called pre-admission screening and resident review that is supposed to both make sure that it's the appropriate placement, and it may well be, for a period of time for individuals, but that there are specialized services that wrap around the individual to make sure that they have the opportunity to sort of transition back to the community or to get necessary supports while they're in there. So I just, 
I didn't want to lose that thread because it's an important thing for us to continue to focus on. It's not as well implemented as you might think in Medicaid, and it's just something that um, oftentimes is not as visible um, because the IDD agency may or may not have um, uh, good visibility into the nursing facility numbers. So I'm sorry to take you off course there, Julie. So Nick, if you'll no. show the first recommendation. So uh, one of our recommendations is just for those states that still are operating institutional settings that want to move forward, um, there are a lot of incentives and, and opportunities within Medicaid to, to help them to do that. Um, Medicaid's had re rebalancing initiatives and really uh, in intellectual and developmental disabilities, we're really pretty far ahead of the aging system in terms of the proportion of people who get services in home and community-based settings um, versus portion who live in institutional settings. I think for uh, our IDD system, 93% of the people who get services in the IDD system live in community settings and 7% live in institutional settings. Um, but the money is like, um, uh, nine or 10% of the money goes to community settings and, and 20% or more than 20% goes to the, the institutions because institutions are much more expensive. However, back to this point, um, Mary mentioned the Money Follows the Persons initiative that's available to all of the states. It's, I think it's still open um, for states to apply to participate and it does help people move. There's moving expenses when you move from an institution, you, have, you, don't, you, have to, you need a bed, you need, you need um, furniture for the place that you're living, you need a whole bunch of other things to get set up. And so there's money to help that happen. Um, Mary? Yeah, the only thing I'd add, it, they, CMS did just recently issue a new notice of funding opportunity for Money Follows the Person, both for new states. And they've also introduced an, um, an opportunity for existing Money Follows the Person states to use. There's like three different strands of money within the Money Follows the Person um, program. And one of those is called supplemental services. And states now can, you, can get 100% reimbursement for those services, and they've expanded what those dollars can be used for to include up to six months of rent, which for those of you who play in Medicaid home and community-based services know that's a, it's an extraordinary policy decision um, and can really be, I think, a game changer in helping people reestablish a community life. Um, so we're hopeful that states also take advantage of that, both new states and for states that have been involved with Money Follows the Person previously, this introduces a, a wonderful new opportunity. Okay, second recommendation, and we'll come. We'll have a discussion about these recommendations before we move on to the next slide. Also, so recommendation number two is we, and we talked about this. We need to create incentives for non-state providers to downsize or close institutions um, because they are their, their monetary incentive is different and their their origins are different. Many of those non-state institutions were started by families who needed a place for their son or daughter to live, uh, and the best model that was available at that time, uh, and the only model that had funding attached to it was the ICF model. Um, and so we have a lot of, of, of institutional funded um, non-state facilities um, that we're, or, or, the origin was, you know, families saying we need, we need services for our kids and there's nothing available for them. And, and so they develop these places. So we've got to do, we've got to, we're not going to get from here to there uh, without helping non-state providers um, to, um, to be successful in this area. Yes. The third policy recommendation, Nick? Can I just jump in on the create yep. incentives? Is that yep. okay? Go ahead. Um, just, just real quick, um, and I think Sherry, you did bring this up, but I think it's a critical piece. The whole issue of real estate ownership mm -hmm. um, is huge in so many states with the non-state settings. So I think that's something that's gonna take some time and, and brain energy to figure out. Absolutely. I mean, the business people who are in the intellectual and developmental disability space are there because they make money. Um, and the way that they make money is on real estate, not mm -hmm. based, not on services. They lose money on services. Right. So, um, right. yeah, we, we have to work on, on, on changing that balance. Um, so the next recommendation is um, to 
we have some states that have been successful at closing all their state-run institutions, and they have a lot of knowledge, and they've developed great systems for how to do that. And I know that NASDES, National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services, does a lot to support networking amongst the states so that those states that have figured something out can help the states that haven't yet figured out um, how to go forward with, with that thing. I think that NASDES has a very important role to play in this particular process. Well, and, and we stand ready to do so. I think there's no better um, mentor or, or um, uh, example for one state to follow than, than, than another state has, who's sort of trailblazed the path. Right. It's notable that you, it's often because of the historic evolution of every state, it's, it's often not a lift and carry or lift and drop a practice into the state, but really thinking right. how to adapt those strategies to effectively, you know, succeed within within a, your given state's circumstances. And so sometimes it's small steps, you know, introducing um, transition coordinators into institutional settings to help individuals and families begin to understand the opportunities that might be available, really building in some um, service options so that individuals can sort of try out different settings without making a full commitment. And I think our members are getting much more adept at sort of building in some of those pieces to really make individuals have that um, uh, opportunity for informed choice um, and, and not just um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, sort of do the trust us um, a bit, but really try to make, make meaningful opportunities for people to experience things before they make a commitment. Nick, the last um, recommendation. We're not gonna be successful um, in uh, shifting the places where people live uh, unless we are also uh, making progress on addressing turnover and vacancy rates for direct support staff and other professionals. Uh, we, we, there's a big issue in terms of affordable and accessible housing. Um, that is a, that's an issue across populations. It's an issue across states. Um, and it does affect people who wanna leave a nursing home or leave a, an institution if they can't find affordable housing somewhere. Um, it doesn't matter if they want to move. Um, they can't move until there's another place for them to go, um, especially if they don't want to move to an existing program um, that is um, lots of people living together. Finally, um, we do need to continue all of the work that the University Centers of Excellence on Intellectual <clears throat> and Developmental Disabilities is doing around sharing best practices around positive behavior supports because there are people who are challenging to figure out uh, how to best support them. Uh, and some of those people are in institution and in order for them to be successful, uh, there's, a, there's a level of knowledge that the community providers need to have. And so um, we, we need to continue to enhance the skills of all of the provider organizations in all of these areas um, in order to, to um, continue to support a system where everybody has um, a, a, an opportunity to choose where they live with who they live and how they live. I, I'll just uh, jump in, Sherry, and I think all of these things are um, front and center across our community service system right now, um, and, and certainly the DSP vacancy challenges uh, reign supreme. But we also, and, and I'm, I think we're in a really wonderful historical place with the investments that are being made in home community-based services right now and the leadership at the Administration for Community Living. We've got unprecedented partnerships across community services and housing. Um, and so I'm cautiously optimistic that we will be able to develop some different strategies for supporting people and having affordable, accessible housing that doesn't require individuals to move when they decide that they'd like to get a different provider, for example. But we have to tackle this issue of individuals with IDD having access to solid, good clinical mental health care. And it's been a, a paucity in our country for a lot of reasons and for many years. Um, and until we are able to ensure that individuals with IDD who, um, like the rest of us, are multidimensional and can also have mental health issues, um, have access to good clinical supports, I think that that third issue is going to continue to be a perennial challenge. And so we've got a call to arms, I think, as a overall community to make sure that we are lifting, um, making progress meaningfully in that area. All right, I think uh, let's move into the discussion. And before we do, I'm just going to, uh, this is this can become become a heated topic. So I'm just gonna remind everyone again to just be respectful, please of each other's opinions. 
Um, remember, I think that we're all coming from sort of the same place of trying to do good. And we're just trying to figure out how to best do it, right? So with that, our first discussion question is, why are some people opposed to digitalization? What can be done to help get them on board? And I will actually uh, even go further than that, uh, especially based on a chat and say, okay, and should we help get them on board? Um, mm -hmm. And I'm gonna actually kick off the discussion with something that occurred to me during during we uh, this conversation. There's a lot of reference to, to people needing to have choice, which I agree with. Um, that choice, however, in my opinion, needs to be real and informed. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, um, we keep talking about, you know, the, this, these alternatives of institutions versus smaller settings in a community in the existing system. Um, what occurred to me as we were talking is that, you know, lack of good alternatives does not does not mean that the status quo is what is best, right? It means that we potentially just need better alternatives. So um, my thought, who wants to, our panelists can chime in, also feel free to unmute yourself and uh, go at it. Just be nice to each other. This is Celia, I'm gonna jump in real quick and just say, um, so, I've worked a lot over the years um, with families, both those who support the institutionalization and those who don't. And I think one of the things that I've realized certainly in the last couple of years with the deinstitutionalization efforts in Pennsylvania is that many of the reasons that people, families in particular are opposed to deinstitutionalization is they don't trust the community system. Um, they and typically they've had bad experiences, and I think that's real. And mm -hmm. I think we have to recognize it, acknowledge it, own it, and figure out how we can do better. Yeah, one of the big things in terms of state-run institutions specifically um, is if if the families of the people who are living there are still alive, because a lot of those people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, and, and no longer have living family members. But if the family members are alive, um, they are looking for something that's going to stay the same and be there. One of the fears of families, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is what's going to happen when I die? Who's going to help my son or daughter navigate the system? What if something doesn't work out and they need to move? Who's going to help them with that? And it's a very legitimate issue, um, especially as the lifespans of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have gone well beyond, you know, the most most die, most people die in childhood to most people live a typical lifespan now um, who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so uh, we're talking about how do we support a person across their lifespan? Um, and there's some really good work going on um, in, in Missouri um, and Mary, um, the NASDES is part of the um, consortium that's working on um, supporting families through the lifespan um, that where, um, helping families to understand and plan for um, the future uh, is, is a very important part of the process. Um, I had a, a couple of questions. Um, I, I'm a parent of, of two kids uh, 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 on the autism spectrum and I work for the Oklahoma uh, USED Center for Learning Leadership. And um, so one thing is um, I just wanted to, to wonder if, if I'm getting rid of the um, institutional bias that that sort of that uh, covers institutional care, but not home and community based services, which makes those long waiting lists that we've all endured, right, uh, or many of us have endured. Um, if, if, if that is another policy recommendation we need to consider. And the second is particularly about my children's diagnosis. I feel like there are many um, younger families who are sort of disconnected from the larger historical debate around developmental disabilities and institutionalization. And there's kind of a movement for reinstitutionalization. 
um, for for um, for people on the autism spectrum that I think is uh, is out of context with this larger debate. And I wondered if people wanted to weigh in on that. Let me just respond with a with a, a little fact. There's about two hundred thousand people with intellectual and developmental disabilities known to state IDD agencies who live with their family members or in their own homes who are waiting for home and community based waiver services. So yes, there is a big waiting list of people looking for services, and and um, it differs from state to state. Some states are now using Medicaid state plan services um, to meet the needs of families, and that's a whole different way of doing services. It's it's a it's a um, uh, home and community-based waiver services are, are optional services. The states are not obligated to serve every person who's eligible. Um, so that that was uh, on the waiting list question. On the ASD question, I'd love to hear what other people are saying, but I know that there are families who want very badly for a place for their son or daughter to live um, and, and don't know the history, don't understand the history of where why, why some people in the IDD community are, are talk about the institutionalization as though it's the end of the it's the end of the line and we'll, when we get there we will have achieved what we need to achieve and others uh, where they're just saying I can't find a place for my I can't find a place to serve my per, my son or daughter how do we do this and so there's a lot of um, yeah there's a lot of need uh, in that community for uh, finding ways to provide those supports. The good news is there are models too available. There are <laughs> there are ways to support individuals with ASD um, that don't require them to give up their right to decide what time they get up in the morning or what time they eat or what they eat or uh, when it, whether they have to leave the house for a certain period of time during the day or any of the other things that got come with being in a in a setting in a congregate setting. Um, Cheryl, this is um, to follow up on that. This is Margaret Hooper. I'm with the Florida DD Council. And um, there are some really great templates on how to deinstitutionalize. There was one from um, the president's um, disabilities group. I can't remember the formal name for it. Some years ago, it was beautifully color coded. and mm -hmm. But part of those beautiful color codings were that you really talk with families, really find out what they want. You also help people find jobs that are in the institution. You have a plan. It takes a year. It takes some years to get it done, you know, if you do it right. But it's just a matter of getting people started. And if, um, if you follow all those pieces to it, it really can be done well. We've closed a lot of institutions in Florida. We have two left. Um, but I was saying in the chat that uh, right now, be, a lot of it's because of um, having trouble finding people to work in nursing and direct supports. It's hard to recommend deinstitutionalization during this workforce crisis. And I'm going to actually piggyback on that because it, it, I mean, it occurs to me that, and this is, I think, a lot of the comments have to do with that as well, is that our community based system is not working particularly well at the moment in too many in too many places for a number of reasons right that does not necessarily mean that institutions are the the gold standard there but it does mean that our community based system needs to be fixed that's that's kind of my my thought and people should have true real choice between several viable real options that's what makes for for good choice and let for real choice until there are actual viable good options we can't call it a choice marty you had a marty ford uh, yes uh i'm marty ford um i would i would also add that some of the history of institutionalization includes um pretty awful things that happen to people when they're hidden away from public view. And I think we have to acknowledge that. And that's one reason why you don't want people um, congregated and hidden. And the language that many of the families are using when they're looking for um, congregate settings, whether they're, you know, special farms or, or gated communities or whatever, the language is is sadly tracking the language that was used to describe the large institutions 
back in the day, you know, people can live among their own kind, be um, uh, away from, you know, the distractions and the pressures of ordinary daily life of our hectic city. Um, you know, they'd be uh, somewhere where they'd be receiving specialized care every day. Um, the, yeah, you just think about it, and that—that's what we what what we read. And you know, I, idyllic um, farmlands. You know, where these beautiful beautiful buildings were, and they would be amongst um, quote their own, but. They were also very isolated from the community and even isolated from their families who could only see them once a month or once a week, if that often. And things can happen there that no one knows about. It's different if, if you're in a setting where you're very close and you can go, go to somebody's apartment down the street or, or house around the corner and see what's happening inside. And when nobody knows what's going on, to be blunt, horrible things can go on. Terrifically terrible things can go on. And um, that's what you need to be afraid of and to avoid. And, and we, we talk about choice, but the other side of that is preventing horror to people who, who are vulnerable um, to awful things happening that they can't talk about, that they can't report to their parents and their family members and their advocates, they can't say what happened to them that week when someone shows up and doesn't understand why they're upset. So that's the other side of it. Um, bad, bad things happen to people when they're, um, when they're isolated and segregated and nobody's looking in. And um, so I just want to put that on the table. We are just, just as an FYI, we're having a restart issue with the part with the slides. So Marty didn't mean to put you like flat on the screen for big, big for everyone, but here you are. Um, but that, that's what happened. Sorry about that. I prefer so to Catherine, be little too. Catherine, <laughs> Catherine Davis. Boundaries. Yep. Hi, Catherine Davis retired gerontologist by trade and a parent of an adult with multiple disabilities. And to shift the conversation slightly in terms of getting people on board and speaking to the opposition that parents quite rightfully have in terms of their fears and their need for security and safety. I found that harnessing the passion of parents when they can speak to one another and give one another their viewpoints, pro or con, is amazing. Mm -hmm. Legislatively, organizationally, within and without government. So I would really encourage any of you who have any access to parents who are willing. And many times our, our retired parents are not engaged um, and they're a resource. Anybody else would like to chime in? Pam Wheeler? Hi, um, my name's Pam Wheeler. I have been a registered nurse for over 30 years. Um, I have had experience in this field and in long-term care. Um, I think that one of our major issues is educating our healthcare professionals. We have to educate our nurses on how to take care of our individuals. Um, they don't teach you these things in nursing school. They didn't back then, they don't now. Um, you get brief overviews of things, but I think it's you know educating our physicians, getting to our pharmacies, I mean, just educating the entire healthcare community and the community in general. People don't know what they don't know. Um, and until you educate them, give them some information, um, give them the knowledge that they need to help care for our individuals. I think, that, I think that's a huge part of, I, I know Marty said, you know, institutions are, are bad and you know, I know everybody has their own opinion on that. My oldest brother passed away at Apple Creek in Ohio back in the early 70s um, because of the way they were. 
um, the care he did not receive. So I think we need to get on board with our healthcare team and, you know, get them educated to help them make a difference in the way things are gone that are going on. Thank you. I mean, if I could just um, respond to Pam a little bit, I think absolutely right on. And as a former USAID director, I think that both the University Centers for Excellence and the leadership um, in education and neurodevelopmental disorders, our LEN programs, um, have a responsibility to be out there with health professionals ensuring that they have the knowledge they need to be able to support everyone's loved ones, no matter where they live, but most particularly community providers need that level of knowledge, information, and support. So I underscore what you say a hundredfold. Hi, everybody. This is Cheryl Powell. Um, I just want to agree with what Becca, the young ladies just said. I used some pretty strong language in the chat by saying that <clears throat> I'd rather be dead than to go into any of them. I have cerebral palsy. And the reason I say that is because, quite frankly, I used to work in one. And I saw how people were treated. And I, I worked in a nursing home and I worked um, in a group home. And I see how the people were treated. And it was a nightmare and it was frightening. Um, and this is in the, the 2000s, okay? So we're not talking about way back in the 50s. It doesn't mean they're all like that. And I know that. I know there's some genuinely good trained people that work in these places, but the majority need the support. They need the education. They need to know how to work when I want with people. So I just support what, what you guys were saying. Lorinda and then Brittany. Hi, this is Lorinda. Um, I'm the mom to a almost 30 year old son with autism, nonverbal, um, very severe. Um, I've been an advocate for many, many, many years, gone through partners in policymaking. Um, and because of those, because of partners basically, and all of the push, that started several years ago about getting the institutions closed, um, I went to one. They said, well, you know, oh, go check it out yourself. So me, I did. And it was, it was a wonderful place. It's been closed down. Um, the director knew everyone's name. They, they, all the guys and girls were, people were coming up to him and he was asking them, oh, how was the ball game the other night? He knew everything about their lives. They loved him. They were all happy. It was a nice facility. They were right in the community within a block of the facility. There was a gas station, a YMCA that they had free memberships to, um, a school, um, another little grocery store. It, anyway, just because it's an institution or just because it's a larger facility does not mean that it's necessarily bad. I think when we take away choices from one end of the spectrum, we're, we're not helping people we're taking away choices. What we need to be looking at and focusing on instead is more oversight and regulations and making sure that these places are safe, that the people that live there aren't being abused, that the people that work there have gone through lots of security and um, things like that. And that obviously if, you're, if you have someone in a place where they're not allowed to see you more than once a month or in certain times or they can't make calls, obviously that's not a good thing. But to me, um, when we talk about choice, um, some of our kiddos can make choices, some choices, but if they had their choice, they would sit in their room and watch the same video all day long and rewind it 6 billion times. And I'm sorry, that doesn't happen in my home. I'm not a bad parent because I have discipline and I make him have responsibilities and we go and do things that transitions are hard. He acts like he doesn't want to go, but he gets there and that's his favorite thing in the whole world. So choice is a very, it's a, it's a fine line when it comes to someone with an intellectual disability who is on the lower functioning end of the spectrum. Um, and also, um, trying to think what else I was going to say. 
Um, and when it comes to safety and security, I mean, bad things can happen in your own home. I have friends who had caregivers that came in and were taking care of their son or daughter, and there were horrible things that happened. So again, it's it, it just because it's in an institution doesn't mean that the safety and security level skyrockets because it doesn't. Um, we just need to make sure that there's better places. I mean, we could have some wonderful facilities that think of it more as like a camp type setting. You have mm -hmm. you have residence halls, you have the the um, dining hall, you have rooms for music, for trains, for videos, for a, a library, things that would that you know share their interests and um, right in the middle of the community, not gated, not enclosed, um, with lots of community outings, that's a real possibility of something that can happen. And we've got to start focusing on those things and having options available to these folks. Because my biggest thing is I compare it to when our kids go off to college and they want to join a sorority or a fraternity and be with folks who are just like them, we think it's wonderful. When our parents get older and they want to move into a facility like a John Knox village or a retirement community with folks who are just like them, who share their interests, we think it's wonderful. But when a person with a disability decides to make that same choice to be with friends who are just like them and share their needs, then suddenly that choice is taken away. Thanks. I would just add before Brittany and then Terry, and then we'll go on because we only have a few minutes left. I would just add um, um, my own personal opinion. I actually would not disagree with anything that you said, as long as they're actual viable, real alternatives with staff, with the same level of care that people can in fact choose and not have a choice of just one place. Brittany and Terry. Can you hear me? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Brittany Wilson here, developmentally disabled adults. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed the presentation. It was so informative and I'm really happy to be here. I think that one of the things that we can do um, to, you know, speak with those who are opposed um, to deinstitutionalization de is to really center the voices and experiences of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, especially those that have made the transition. No, not everyone that has a disability is the same or needs the same supports. We all mm -hmm. know that, but I think that, you know, there's got to be some more, um, relationship building, especially with parents. How can we come together and be authentic um, and have people with intellectual and developmental disabilities at the center of every single conversation, um, us sharing our experiences? I think that that's critical. I think that that's something that's missing. Um, and I think that getting stories out there and changing the narrative and having us um, you know, be out there sharing our stories is just really, really critical to this. And I also just really appreciate the points about how much money is made when people are institutionalized, because that's just such a big thing. People, you know, there's companies and entities that make so much money off of people with disabilities. And so I think that that needs to be spoken about as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Terry Bluffo, please go ahead. All right, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I've heard a lot of negative things about uh, facilities today. I live in Louisiana. Our 43 year old daughter functions at the level of a three year old. The community home that we had placed her in quite a few years back controlled her behavior with uh, psychotropic drugs. They almost killed her. We moved to the state run facility and they saved her life. And today she continues to do good. A few years ago, our governor forced people out of facilities and into the community. We had 90 year old parents who took their 50 year old son out of our facility, moved him into a privately owned facility where three weeks later, he bit another individual and the private provider told these 90 year old parents, he is not allowed to live here anymore. You have 24 hours to take him out. At 90 years old, these people had to struggle. Please be open-minded enough to know 
that people deserve a true choice. Not everyone can survive in the community. Not everyone is good for a facility. Our facility has a horse ranch, a bakery, playground, canteen. The residents have the right of way walking or riding their bikes, those who can. A facility is not an institution. It is an ICF, an immediate care facility. An institution just makes it sound like a prison, which it is definitely not. Our kids roam around freely. My wife and I can visit our daughter any time of day or night. Makes no difference, and I do. So please keep an open mind that not everybody can fit in one place. One size does not fit all. Please remember that and offer people a true choice. Visit a facility if you want. When, I, when my wife and I visited our facility, we were amazed how nice it was because we had heard just negative things about it from private providers. I stand for our facility. I advocate for our facility. It is not perfect. But when you buy a brand new car and you have a flat tire, do you go buy a new car or do you just have the tire fixed? When we see issues going on at our facility, we try to repair those things and get people out of there who are not fit to service our people. Please keep an open mind and give people a true choice. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, we have literally four minutes left, so I'm going to see if our panel would like to react sort of to the cumulative uh, things that they, to all, everything that we've heard so far. And then um, I'm gonna just put the link to where this recording and the slides will be posted. And then um, and then we'll probably call it, call it a day. So Celia and Sherry and Mary Sowers, anything you'd like to respond with to what has been said so far? I think this has been an amazing discussion. Um, I've certainly learned a lot, heard a lot, um, and hope that we can move forward together um, and implement so many of the suggestions that have been made. So thank you all for being here and for giving me the opportunity to join you. Um, I would echo Celia's thanks and um, very much appreciate um, the grounding, I think that Brittany provided to make sure that we've got individuals with disabilities at the center of these discussions and lifting their voices up in, at every opportunity. Um, Sherry mentioned that our team at NASDES is working with the University of Missouri at Kansas City in terms of supporting individuals in the context of their families and really helping individuals and families design what a good life looks like for them. And so um, definitely appreciate this. It, I'm feeling um, a, a, a continued um, urgency to make sure that um, that our community-based services, frankly, live up to the commitment um, that that um, that we are making to individuals and families. And we've just got to do a better job in a number of areas to make that a reality across the country. So many, many thanks. Julie, if you can move to the next slide, um, I will. Um... I just wanted to show what our what our next set of questions was if we had extra time. <laughs> the question is, what do we where do we go from here? What do, how do we know when we're done? If we're ever done, we're probably never done. Um, and what about people in other types of institutions? And I guess I I like that we had a forum today where people could speak their mind. I it was uh, it's important to hear the perspectives of. Um, of people who have different opinions uh, about our system and where the where the the gaps are and where the where the needs are, um, our system is not perfect. None of the parts of our system are perfect, and so um, th I want to thank everybody for coming. All the chat uh, people who didn't get to talk but who entered their uh, uh, ideas in the chat. Um, this is a discussion that will probably continue throughout the rest of my career uh, and beyond. Um, and it's okay that that, that happens. Um, my, my thought in bringing this issue forward was just that, um, you know, when, when the risk project started, we literally were looking at a system that was only really large institutions. And today we have a system that only 9% of people who receive services live in institutions. Everybody else yes. lives in other kinds of places. And that's, um, I, I think, continuing examination of, of our service <clears throat> system and making sure people's needs are met is where we need to head. 
if any of you would like to get a hold of any of us, please feel free to do so um, for really any any ideas, thoughts, suggestions, feedback. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thank you for to our panelists. Great discussion as usual. Um, very lively today. Really appreciate it. Have a good rest of your Thursday and uh, a good coming weekend as well.